Hey, welcome back. Good to have you here. Today, we got a very, very, very special guest. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our special guest, Mr. Gregory McPop. Oh, totally great to be here, like flattered you invited me um happy um ecstatic can't wait to you know share what i know with you guys it's gonna be lit and stuff yeah it is gonna be lit let's get started shall we all right hierarchical linear models so here are our objectives. I am not going to review them here. If you want, you can pause your video and stuff. So what's this all about? You remember how we've always made the assumption of independence? What does that mean? We have assumed that scores are not correlated with one another. Now what I, that doesn't mean is, I'm not saying that X and Y can't be correlated. I'm saying that x1 and x2 can't be correlated. In other words, whatever x1 does, it cannot influence x2. Well, sometimes that's not a very easy assumption to make. For example, if we measure the same person multiple times, of course, their measurement at time 1 is going to be correlated with their measurement at time 2. Likewise, if we measure family members, what my brother says is probably going to influence what I says, what I says, what I says, he says, he says, he says, he says, what I says. Uh, likewise, uh, what I say is going to influence what my little brother says because he looks up to me and he loves me and he adores me and he thinks I'm awesome. Okay? And can't forget my little sister. Um, she thinks I'm nuts. Likewise, if we measure students taught by the same teacher, uh, the way they answer the questions are probably going to be correlated because we are indirectly assessing the teacher's skill. And likewise, if we measure people from the same region, their scores are going to be correlated with one another. But it happens. So scores become correlated. And back in the day, the way we used to deal with it, the way that I was taught-ish, well, it, it, I was taught this, but this was when uh, hierarchical linear models were certainly well developed. So I was taught both ways. Uh, so with repeated measures, ANOMA, ANOVA, ANOMA, 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 ANOVA, 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 ANOVA. Yeah. Shall we get back to it? All right, uh, with repeated measures ANOVA, we temporarily pretend that subjects are factors. So we treat them as if it was a experimental effect. And then what we do is we estimate the effect of each person. So what is the Dustin effect? The Dustin effect is awesome. Ha! And then after that, at the end of the algorithm, we make an adjustment to our tests of significance. Uh, that adjustment, however, assumes what we call sphericity. What is it? Don't worry about it. Kind of complicated. Uh, so we used to, to address the sphericity assumption, we used to use what's called the multivariate approach, where we treat each measure as a separate dependent variable, and then we used MANOVA to analyze the data. So that's how we used to do things. We don't really do things that way anymore. At least not many people do because those have serious limitations. Instead, what we use are mixed models or hierarchical linear models or multi-level models. You get the idea. And not anymore. Yeah, back in the 1990s, there was a lot of development that happened in hierarchical models, um, aka mixed models. I have hierarchical linear models. Okay, anyway, whatever multi-level models, etc., etc. These models have made repeated measures, ANOVAs, all but obsolete. They handle missing data naturally. They don't require more time points. Or, I'm sorry, they don't require fixed time points. Like with an ANOVA, you have to 
assume that the subjects were measured at exactly the same time. And in addition to that, they're more flexible. So with that, yeah, that, that was a great introduction, man. That, that was like stellar and stuff, dude. I, I really appreciate it, man. So yeah, um, HLM, you know, is, is totally awesome, you know. So uh, it goes by lots of different names, you know, hierarchical linear models, multi-level models, mixed effect models, mixed models, basically all the same, man. That's, that's just totally the same thing, dude. So uh, yeah, situations where HLM is necessary, we kind of talked about this already. So anytime there's like clustering and stuff in the data, we need to do HLM, really, you know. So let's say we collect clients uh data from clients who had, who had the same therapist like dr collins clients dr smith's clients and we already went through this i'm just gonna skip through this you know like students from the same classroom collect measurements on the same person stuff like that you know so if you if you really care to see a visual you can look at this you know so we got like dr russell who has patient one two and three and then we got dr smith who's got like patient four five and six and then Dr. Bean, <laughs> you ever watch Mr. Bean? I love that show, man. That guy's, that guy's freaking hilarious, dude. <laughs> yeah, so he's got three clients now, you know, P7, P8, P9, you know, totally cool guy. Okay, moving on. Uh, so if you were to see this in data form, for example, uh, in row one, you would see different patients, P1 through P9. And then here's, here's the thing that you're really looking for is if you see repeats like this, you know, that, uh, that, that kind of indicates that you got some uh, hierarchical stuff because P1, P2, and P3, they're like what we say, we, they're, they're nested within Russell, man. You know, it's, it's totally cool, and they got their, their uh, depression scores there. So, yeah, totally cool. And so here, here's another one, you know, got my shout-out to Matt Nebru there. Like, what up, Matt Nebru? <laughs> You're on the PowerPoint. How's that feel? You're famous and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so my buddy Dustin there, you know, he's got T1, T2, T3. We got Matt. He's got T1, T2, and three, three. These different measurements, of course. Uh, and then Ebru, married at time, three times. But uh, you don't need to measure Matt and Ebru more than one time, man, because what you got is the best ever. <laughs> yeah. Shout out to you guys. You guys are awesome. And the rest of you guys, too. You know, if I had more room, I would have put everybody on here. Because you're all awesome. Love you guys. Thank you. Um, guess I'll take over now. So why is HLM necessary? Well, suppose we have measures of mood and performance of three completely unknown and random people. We just calling out names at random. Um, let's say Donald Hillary and Obama. Again, totally random names. Uh, and we want to ask if there, or the degree to which there is a relationship between their mood and performance. And higher mood means they're not moodiness, but you know, happy mood. So what conclusions could we make about this? Well, if we were to do what's called a disaggregated analysis, we treat each data point as if they are independent. In other words, we ignore the different colors. So what does this analysis suggest? Well, this analysis suggests that as one's mood increases, their performance also increases. But we are ignoring the assumption of independence, and that tends to lead to inflated type 1 errors. Why is that? Well, let's say I measure 25 people four times and obtain a mean of 17.5. Now remember, a p-value estimates the probability of the null hypothesis uh, if, in this example, 100 people had at, uh, well, I'm, yeah, a, the probability of the data, not the probability of the null hypothesis, probability of the data given the null hypothesis, if, in this example, 100 people had a mean of 17.5. Now, but now we're estimating the probability of the data given the null hypothesis if only 25 truly independent people had a mean of 17.5. In other words, with a sample size of 100, if we, if we treat them as if they are independent, then we are artificially inflating our degrees of freedom. And so it's going to lead to inflated type 1 error rates. 
And I think I've said this before, and I'll say this again, that of all the assumptions you could violate, don't violate the assumption of independence, because you're just going to screw things up. And if you violate the assumption of independence, that just means you need to use a different model, such as a mixed model. No big deal. All right, we can also inflate type 2 error rates or just misunderstand an effect completely, just like in the picture. So this picture seems to suggest that as an individual's mood goes up, their performance goes up, but that is only between persons. It is not within persons. So what is the... Um, so that is uh, what we call the disaggregated analysis. Here is the aggregate analysis. And what we do is we average the data points, then fit the model to the average. So we have reduced our degrees of freedom here. Uh, so we took it from, in this example, we had three, six, nine data points. We've taken it down to three. And so we are no longer inflating, excuse me, type one error rates uh, because we've reduced our sample size. But our, so the data points are independent now, but have we lost anything with the analysis? Well, it's answering the wrong question, or at least a different question. We want to know how much an individual's mood affects their performance. This is telling us that those who are high in mood tend to be high in performance. But again, that's not what we're asking. So now let's look at an HLM analysis. Well, what does an HLM analysis do? So basically it says, what if we fit the mood performance relationship for each individual? Now, how are mood and performance related? Well, it looks like there is a negative relationship. As you increase in mood, your performance actually goes down. Maybe you get a little overconfident. So this is what HLM does. It fits, or it at least has a flexibility to fit a different regression line for each cluster. In this case, that would be each person across time. So once a line is fit for each person, it then averages the fit across individuals. And for a visual of that, that's what that red line is. So we call the red regression line the fixed effects line. And the deviations from that we call the random effects lines. So summary, if we treat individuals within cluster as independent samples, we're going to screw things up. Ask me how I know. The biostatistician I got into a disagreement with another researcher where they were trying to treat each data point as if they were independent. I said, you can't do that. She said, yes, I can. I said, you can, but you can't. And when we did it the correct way, which uh, in this case, we didn't do HLM as I recall. Actually, no, we did do HLM. Uh, and when we did that, estimates were totally different totally off when you just treated the data as if they were independent. So again, in summary, HLM more or less fits separate regression lines for each individual. In reality, it's exceptionally more complicated than that, and that's the basic, I but that's the basic idea. Now, buckle up, y'all. It's about to get mathy. Yeah, I mean, like, but really, there's no reason to be scared or anything, you know? <laughs> Math ain't gonna hide under your bed and bite you at night or anything, you know? It's not like a monster in your closet, you know? You don't need to sleep with the light on or anything like that. You know, it, uh, we, you know, we psychology, you guys are clinicians, and you know, and what's the best way to overcome a fear? You know, exposure, right? So this is just exposure. Just stick with it, y'all, you know? Whoa. I just said y'all. That was weird. Stick with it, dudes, because totally you're going to get it, you know? All right. So we're going to get a bit mathy here. And uh, so remember, remember this formula? You know, back in the day, we said depression is equal to B0 plus B1 times stress plus E, your error. Well, I kind of lied to you. Well, your professor kind of lied to you, you know? It's actually not that simple, dude, you know? So what we've been missing all along is... You got depression subscript I, you know. So subscript I plus equals B0 plus B1 times stress sub I plus E sub I. So basically what we're saying here, you know, is that I indexes the person. So depression subscript I is the depression score for the ith person, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's what it means, you know. 
So for example, you know, if you look at this, you know, let's say we're looking at Andy. Andy's, uh, his index is three, meaning he's a third person. So what we could say is depression subscript three is the depression for Andy, which is 18.8. .8. And so our model might say that depression subscript three is equal to B0 plus B1 times stress sub three, which for Andy is 7.7. .7. Okay, that's all it is. Yeah, thank you. So things get a little bit more complicated with hierarchical linear models. So in standard regression, we had just one subscript. But with HLM, we have uh, two subscripts. We've got an I and we've got a J. So depression subscript IJ refers to depression of person I who belongs to therapist J. Or another example, it depends. It, uh, it might refer to depression uh, at time point I belonging to person J. So doing, uh, doing this allows us to model different slopes and intercepts for each group. So for example, we might have depression subscript I J is equal to B zero sub J plus B one sub J times stress sub I plus E sub I J. So let's break that down. So depression sub I J means that we have different depression levels for each person nested within each therapist. And that is a function of an intercept that differs for each therapist. Remember J is therapist. And we've got a different slope that differs across different therapists. Again, J means different therapists. And then we got stress scores that differ across each person, which is why that has a subscript of I. And then we've got an error that is unique to each person and therapist combination. I suppose under stress, you could have I, J as well. And that's probably the way you should do it, but you get the idea. And so now the reason why they call it hierarchical linear models or multi-level models is now we said B equal or we had a B zero sub J. Well, that now gets its own level and we see say B zero J is equal to gamma zero zero, which is the grand or the average intercept plus U sub zero J. So all that's saying is that we've got an average intercept and each therapist, again, therapist is J, has its own deviation. So in the first level of the model, we have E sub I J, which that was our sigma before. You guys are familiar with that. And what that said was that the data points deviate from the line and that's what E I J represents. And we're just explicitly recognizing that people don't fit the line exactly. Well now, instead of having E, we have a U. So in that first equation, we're saying, hey, we know that everybody that the therapists differ in their intercept and to explicitly recognize that there are different, there's variability about that average intercept. We're going to have a parameter or not a parameter, a variable called U in there. And likewise for the intercept. So there is going to be a grand intercept, which is gamma one zero. And then there are going to be deviations from that uh, did I say intercept? If I did, I meant to say slope. So gamma one zero is the grand slope or the average slope across all therapists. But again, every therapist has their own unique individual slope. And we recognize that with the um, variable U. So this says that depression is a function of several things. It's a function of an intercept that differs between therapists. Or in other words, there's a different intercept for each therapist. And it says that there is a slope that differs between therapists. Or in other words, there is a different slope for each therapist. And it says that there is stress at the individual level. Oh, look at that. I all circled and stuff. And so the gammas represent the grand intercept and the grand slope. And then the U sub 0J is or 1j is therapist j's deviation from the grand mean or the grand intercept. So anyone's head exploded yet? Boom! Uh, it's all right, ain't gonna kill you. Like my buddy here said, 
don't be afraid just relax get used to it watch the video again think about it you know the richard feynman said that uh, nobody understands math people just get used to it so it's okay to not understand it just get used to it so we will see some models where we introduce the notation but with graphics how's that sound sound good so uh what was i gonna say oh in class what we're gonna do is i'm going to go over figures notation and images and graphical representations of each of these models and then we're just going to practice and practice and practice till you get it y'all does that sound good so that is our video for today thank you for joining me thank you to our special guest oh dude it was an absolute pleasure man absolute pleasure you know anytime yeah we will probably invite you back anyway peace out